no. <laughs> Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning from the Czech Chamber of Commerce here in Prague. A very warm welcome to our workshop series on sustainability. We're very happy that you joined us in such a big number. And if you have been as me asking after the end of uh, February, what will become of sustainability as a topic? Will we need to stop it? Will other things be more important? Then now the time we have seen sustainability has got a new twist. Sustainability helps to lower <coughs> what you need in energy, in other materials. And the main aim of today is to show you, to give you inspiration on how to do it. So if you do not have, have yet started, to think about sustainability, now it's the time. And if you're looking for good inspiration, then you are at the right place for the next approximately three hours. It's a hybrid event. And if you have questions from, uh, from the online uh, participants, please put them into the chat and we will put them forward to the respective speakers. If you want to have any detailed questions, so please drop us a line and we will connect you. And the whole event will be recorded. So even if you feel, okay, that was great. I want to send it over to our colleagues. We will get in touch with you via email and send you the link to our YouTube channel. And now it's my great pleasure to pass over the word to the president of the, uh, uh, sorry, to the, uh, sorry, to my boss to make it sure. <laughs> My name is Adam. Thank you for your intro to our partners for sustainability platform. Okay, thank you very much, Martina Jakob, for your introduction. <laughs> Good morning, um, your partners, supporting partners, members of the chamber, and guests. Welcome to our hybrid workshop. Uh, the topic is sustainability as a strategy to tackle rising prices. Thank you all for joining us this morning. And thank you, a special thank to the Partners for Sustainability who are supporting us since two years already now. The, today's workshop series on central issues of sustainability and energy efficiency should have taken place at the beginning of March, as you know, but the outbreak of the war in Ukraine caught our attention and brought to the fore our need to help the victims of the war as best as quickly as possible. Instead of the sustainability down to Earth conference, the Partners for Sustainability and us, the Chamber, reacted very quickly and we organized a conference on the topic Help for Ukraine. And I can tell you that 5,000 euros could be saved and donated to UNICEF to help the children in Ukraine affected by the war. And I would like to thank everybody who was supporting this um, action we did. So special thanks to everybody. We are convinced that today's workshop will become even more important against the background of the dramatic geopolitical changes as we will talk about energy efficiency, efficiency production, future clean mobility, German supply chain law, very important circularity, and the future of ESG. So all crucial topics. So I'm very happy that the workshops were out after all, they are something like a temporary capstone for the top topic 2021-2022, but certainly not the end of this platform, Partners for Sustainability, which we have built up together with such commitment. And that's why we have a suggestion for you. We would like to create a permanently working group under the roof of the German Czech Chamber of Commerce and Industry because no company, no industry can avoid the issue of sustainability today. And the partners for sustainability are the platform that couldn't be better prepared for the founding of such a working group. It will also, also be excellent to continue the best practice tour <coughs> we did in the past. That's an excellent format. And the partners for sustainability should also play an important role at our German Czech Economic Forum, which will be held on October 17th this year. And we have the honor to have a special guest this year. He already confirmed his presence. 
It's the Vice Chancellor and Minister of Industry, Germany and, and Climate Protection, Robert Habeck, and he already confirmed that he will come to Prague on October 17th. So you should be there. So we will contact you beforehand, and I would like to thank all Partners for Sustainability for your great work and commitment over the past two years. And I would like to name everybody of you. It's Vodafone, T-Mobile, Chukoda Auto Schunk, Siemens, Aufland, Home Tief, Hettich, ING, E.ON, Rose, Bosch, Borgas, BASF, Allianz, and Aintech. This is an impressive Premier League of companies. Thank you very much. Looking back and looking ahead, we will certainly accompany us uh, during lunchtime later on, which will be at the end of this workshop today. I would like to thank all my colleagues, the team who organized this uh, event today and the past two years the platform. And I also would like to thank the speakers and presenters today. So lots, I wish you lots of inspirations and thank you very much for coming. Have a good day. Now, before coming to the next point in our program, introverts from representatives of our Partners for Sustainability. So if you're not familiar with our platform and with our Partners for Sustainability, we will show you a quick video who we are and what we stand for.
So now we have seen also the join us presentations. You will also get them. And the join us is main series from our side. And if you now want to also do see in person, if you want to join us, you will meet them. So the first two, they would like to give you a short input on what is going on at their side with sustainability, what are the challenges, and also good examples of this year. So it's happy to, on behalf of the Partners for Sustainability, to welcome to the floor representatives of Siemens and Brose. So the signatures were a little longer, so we'll be a little quicker. Um, we at Siemens are uh, always like we considering what would be our priorities within the ESG framework. And as all of us, uh, we had to reconsider in the last three months. So uh, I have to say that after 170 years, we came to the conclusion that our activities in Russia were no more sustainable and um, made the drums we announced we would be winding down our operations in the country after 170 years. So that was something that we were not planning to do. However, we feel it is a sustainable step to do with regards to the uh, atrocities that are happening in Ukraine. The topics that are on the top of our agenda today are the words we will be hearing uh, many times uh, this morning, I expect, and it is flexibility and resilience and if you ask Siemens, what can we bring to the table on those three areas, that is digitalization. Digitalization for us is the answer to all the hurdles we are experiencing uh, due to the economic and geopolitical development in recent years and months. We believe that uh, digitalization and uh, its solution can help companies like ours and the companies of our customers to increase their energy efficiency. And when we see the rising prices of uh, energies and resources, that's bad news on one side, but on the other side, it means that the payback period of investments into energy efficiency are shorter, which is a good, which is definitely good. Now, digitalization also offers one uh, good benefit, and that is flexibility uh, with a digital. Uh, uh, supply chain, you can be flexible, you can outsource, you can insource from many sources. So that is also an area our Siemens is uh, increasingly active. And uh, when we have a look at the world today, resilience is something that all the companies and states and infrastructure companies need more than ever. And that is also where our technologies can help uh, resilience, uh, that is infrastructure. And that is not being uh, in a position that nothing can happen to you your company, it is that after something happens that you can be back on your feet as quickly as possible to really continue the operations and then um, be more sustainable. So these are the topics that are on our agenda uh, today. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we are working on the decarbonization plans for uh, our factories and our operations. And our goal to be uh, carbon neutral by 2030 is still in place. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the platform um, and for also having the chance to be a part of today's workshop um, and to also the chance to give a few words at the beginning. When we started two years ago, this platform, um, the topic of uh, sustainability was more a virtual one, at least for us in Brosa. Nevertheless, we understood that um, the topic becomes real, more and more real, um, due to the fact that the uh, political situation, the market situation, and also our customers are pushing more and more on future sustainability. We were always strong in the sustainability in relation to our employees in the social areas, but topics like CO2 neutrality was not, say, our biggest priority. Nevertheless, as I said, the factors are changing, we are changing, and uh, also thanks to that platform, uh, we could see how other partners are doing 
um, they weigh the strategy for the next years, how to become sustainable. We all face in the current situation to a huge instability. Um, if we look on the last two to three years, COVID, electronic situation, war in the Ukraine, increasing prices on each side. So sustainability is not only about being CO2 neutral, but also to be efficient. And I am happy that uh, we can discuss it today during the workshops, and I'm really looking forward. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Peter, for and Zoranaka uh, Roa for those words on sustainability for the purpose of sustainability. And before we start with the workshops to give us a short time to uh, prepare the speakers, you will get a video on how sustainability is important for one of our partners. At Vodafone, at Vodafone, we are passionate about making the world more connected, sustainable and inclusive. All colleagues can work flexible hours and new parents get four months of fully paid leave. Our management is 40% female and we have strong policies to ensure equal pay. We have a reputation for welcoming LGBT colleagues, we fight domestic violence and we support people with disabilities. We believe in connecting for a better future and not just with optical fibre. I think we are finished with the video, right? So we can continue. <laughs> <laughs> it was only you. Uh, can we switch on the, the presentation? Mm -hmm. Fine. Thanks a lot. The ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks a lot for being here today. Uh, our purpose today and, and the goal is to effectively summarize what ESG is, why is it important now, uh, how much is it driven by taxonomy and all other uh, regulatory efforts? And what does it mean for companies? How to take this, this theory uh, into practice? So we have theoretical part as well as practical part. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, also Czech German Chamber of Commerce that uh, this platform was put together because uh, we have come across uh, many companies who are at the forefront and one of them today is with me, uh, Vodafone and uh, Zuzana Hola. Zuzana Hola is a head of sustainability uh, in Vodafone. And effectively, did you know that Vodafone was one of the first global companies to already in 2010 have its own sustainability report? Did you know that they had their ESG strategy embedded in the business already in 2010? Did you know that they have the GRI reporting, which means Global Reporting Initiative Standards, already in 2010? I mean, we have a long way to go, uh, to be honest. So from that perspective, I'm very happy that uh, Zuzana is here. She's very passionate about sustainability and she is very passionate about taking the theory into practice. And this is what uh, she will show you today. I have another colleague here with me and a dear guest, uh, Frank Ebinger. Uh, hi, Frank. A, a very short, a short intro. Uh, Frank is engaged in sustainability over 25 years, 25 years. He is working in Nuremberg Campus of Technology. And when I researched it, I have realized that this uh, campus is actually also uh, working with sustainability for over 25 years. They have a number of innovative solutions. They have a, a number of awards uh, for their innovative solutions. So I think this is also a very great place to effectively start using uh, and, and start trying to see how we can implement these sorts of uh, uh, innovations which are available already there and now. Uh, Frank is very passionate, not just about sustainability, he's a research professor, but also transformation. And I think this is what we will be talking about, that transition, transformation, change of behavior is actually essential part of sustainability. But let's not bore you too much. Uh, let, let's probably jump to the subject. Uh, taxonomy. I will not spend too much time. I just want to create a common ground. I think all 
who we are sitting here by now know very well what taxonomy means because it is impacting our business, our regulatory obligations uh, going forward. So to be very short, uh, taxonomy brings effectively a unique language uh, and a common language for all players on the capital markets to understand what sustainability is, what is not. If it is sustainable, it means it mitigates or uh, adapts uh, to climate change because there are only two out of six uh, uh, environmental goals known uh, by now or uh, other are, uh, in the, others are in the preparation. Uh, it needs to significantly contribute to these two. Uh, it needs to meet the uh, technical screening criteria, uh, so-called so delegated acts. It does not do significant harm, which is one of the most uh, difficult parts uh, of uh, the assessment, and meets minimum social safeguard. Out of this, you see that first, uh, really taxonomy as you know it now, is only a starter. We have only two goals uh, um, in, in detail out of six. We will also come across social, and governance uh, the taxonomy. So from that perspective, there is still a long way to go. And if you already have an impression that it's too much, it's just the ground zero. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, the the uh, taxonomy as such covers only 10 macro sectors or better to say six with some subsectors, but uh, these are only 10 areas who, who are the most uh, uh, and largest contributors uh, to, to the emissions. And uh, who are the users effectively now? It's financial market participants, large corporates, EU member states. What does it mean for all of you sitting here? You might say, okay, uh, we have non-financial reporting directive. We have uh, corporate sustainability reporting directive. One of them is coming sooner and it's already in place, uh, which is for listed companies with more than 500 employees, which only relates to 25 corporates in the Czech Republic. And they are already reporting this year on eligible activities. Next year on aligned activities, which means they will need to be fully in line with EU taxonomy. CSRB covers uh, uh, or is expanding the base uh, of non-financial and financial reporting in sustainability. And that already has uh, three criteria. This will capture more than 1,000 or even 1,500 corporates in Czech Republic. And it starts and, and comes to validity actually 2024, 2025. But Let's, let's not slip away on this because all smaller companies are parts of supply chains of yours, uh, big boys. So from that perspective, given the fact that you will need to report just, for example, on uh, carbon footprint, scope one, two, three, you will have to have visibility in your supply chain and your supply chain needs to be up to speed already in 2024, which is a little bit of a contradiction to taxonomy saying that SMEs and mid caps are coming to, to validity 2026 or 2027. So from that perspective, all of us are impacted already effectively immediately as of 2023. And we need to acknowledge, acknowledge that. And th this way we will be able to effectively live with it <laughs> much easier. And what, did, what can banks and why am I talking about it as ING? Uh, the banks try to do an ESG questionnaire uh, for all the corporates and please use it not just for yourself but for the entire supply chain, which is a little guidance as to what uh, information requirements will be there in the coming years. It, it is available on the, uh, on the web page of, of Czech Banking Association and effectively 16 banks who signed up a sustainability memorandum contributed to it. It will help your supply chain to start organize itself in terms of collection of data and in terms of focus uh, going forward. And last but not least, uh, we have here also money. So today what we are bringing in our panel is technology, it's money and it's knowledge uh, and research. And as you are aware, and we will not go into detail, banks are here to help you to finance your transition, not just in terms of advisory, but also in terms of financing. And this is a dedicated financing or transformational financing. It is not the purpose of today, but it is just to let you know that we are here for you and to support you. And now I would uh, hand over to Zuzana, uh, to, to, <laughs> to Frank, <laughs> sorry, Frank. And uh, Frank will follow up actually to, to the taxonomy and regulatory issues and particularly related to supply chain law. And why, am I, why are we speaking about it? We have highlighted that SMEs and mid caps uh, should come based on taxonomy uh, or CSRD, NFRD to, uh, in 2005, 2006, uh, uh, 2026. But uh, what will Frank actually show you is that uh, based on the law, which is already implemented in Germany and many other EU, company, uh, EU um, 
states will uh, want to implement it uh, much sooner uh, than, uh, than uh, later, uh, it, it will be part of this. Frank, yeah. uh, can you hear us? Yes, of course, us? of course. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what <okay>. sound? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> it was uh, too loud. Go ahead. Sorry, we have a technical issue to solve. <laughs> 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 we are not aware of it. <laughs> uh, and I'm not a tech. Uh, <laughs> our, our support is not here right now. So, should I speak uh, speak a little? Frank? Yeah, I can hear you. And can you hear me? Yeah, I sag jetzt gerade was. Yeah, hört ihr mich? Hört ihr mich? Hallo, ja. hallo, hallo. Ja. Can, könnt ihr mich hören? Ist das okay? <lacht> ja, haut das hin. <lacht> Kennt ihr mich hören? Ja? Ist es okay? Ich, ich kann euch hören, aber ich weiß nicht, ob ihr mich hört. I, I, I can hear you, but I don't know if you hear me. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, but the others in the main, <laughs> on the main board, that, thank you, Lubas, uh, that, you, that you have responded. So <laughs> it seems that there is some still. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. So should I start? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you very much then. Uh, so uh, we, we jump into that uh, other focus. Um, I, I just want to refer to uh, the legal sustainability trans uh, transparency movement. Um, as, as Eva said, right, that uh, there are some, some several legal affairs uh, coming up to, to the companies, not only on the national level, but also on the European level. And um, it, it's not only about the ESG reporting, so Corporate Social Responsibility Directive, but also to an aspect which uh, companies now uh, yeah, brings a little headache to, um, the uh, German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. Uh, this is, um, is a new law from, from Germany, in Germany, for companies who are located in Germany. And um, this, uh, this law describes um, the, the, uh, the, the human rights um, issues or the human rights responsibilities uh, of certain companies. The scope of the application uh, is addressed to uh, large companies regardless of, uh, regardless of their industry. So in, uh, starting from 2023, more than 3,000 employees, companies with, uh, with 3,000 employees and above, uh, have to follow this law and then later on one year later um, the, the the companies uh, with uh, with employees more than thousand uh, will will have to address it so um, it starts from 2023 so next year already um, and um, the companies should then report in 2024 but this law is not not only a national um, so to say, emphasis uh, on, on this issue uh, on, on human rights, it's also the starting point of a broader discussion. And that's what I meant with uh, there is a movement coming uh, towards companies. Uh, um, because um, this, this law describes certain structural uh, prerequisites. I don't want to go in detail to that because uh, I did already uh, at the, uh, the Partners for Sustainability a workshop on that. So it's just to remind uh, our partners and, and you maybe as audience uh, that you have to fulfill certain steps of implementation, for example, risk analysis, risk management, you have to uh, to, to identify an internal human rights representative who is then responsible for everything. You have to do a policy statement. You have to uh, to prevent uh, to do some prevention measures, remedial actions, and so on. And you have to document it and report it to the BAFA. Uh, this is the uh, the responsible authority in Germany. Having said this, this structure is now discussed as well on the European Union level. And um, uh, we, we currently discussed since February uh, an, an called white paper, so to say, or a draft proposal, uh, which is now um, under consideration. And you can see 
uh, if you if you compare the German and the European um, discussion, uh, then there are some some similarities, but as well, uh, not only similar aspects, but even on the European Union, it goes above it. Yeah. So the European Union uh, discusses at the moment um, an, an, a legal affair for employees, 500 companies who have uh, 500 um, employees and above. Uh, and uh, 150 million turnover. And in some risk sectors, even uh, companies are affected, so which have then 250 employees and above. So that means um, if, if the Euro European law comes into force, then uh, much more companies are affected by that uh, supply chain due diligence aspect. And um, in, in comparison to the German one, um, the European will, will look as well on more environmental issues. And uh, that's what Eva said. Uh, it's not only, not only the social issues, but also uh, many more environmental issues are, are considered under that law. Um, and in the, the, the next difference is that on the European level um, is, um, is the addressee all levels of the global value chain. It's, it's upstream and downstream at the, at the moment in discussion, while in the German law, it's only the direct partners. So your, your suppliers are affected by the law and you, you as a company who has to, to report on that, you have to, to work collaboratively and closely with your direct suppliers, where then in the future, maybe um, the European, uh, on the European level, all levels of the global value chain are, are affected. So that means uh, you have to know, you have to, to make transparent your whole value chain up and downstream, which is, uh, which is a huge, uh, uh, huge business. Um, in, I jump over because uh, if I just gave me five minutes, um, so uh, and, and that's the reason why I, I concentrate on, on another thing. Um, I want to, uh, to mention that um, you have maybe in future an, an issue with liability. So um, at the moment there is, um, is a discussion on, uh, on liability for the damage caused in, um, in, in your value chain as a result of failure to take preventive and remedial measures. So that makes, makes then uh, maybe uh, an issue or brings an issue on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the table uh, that you maybe uh, are, um, are responsible for something which is a supplier responsible for, usually a, a supplier is responsible for, and you have to, to be very careful uh, in order not to take any liability risks any, uh, anyhow. Yeah, and the enforcement, um, so um, the controls by national supervisory authorities should be, should be um, established. And uh, in addition, uh, maybe we, we've, uh, we have some, some um, regulatory on the national level follows that uh, due diligence directive. Uh, so this is just a, a small introduction into that topic. And I think we can uh, discuss that uh, later on in our questions and answers session. And I hand over back to Eva, please. Thanks a lot, Frank. And maybe one question, and all the other questions will come at the end of the session. Why did Germany decide actually to, to be a pioneer in, in this uh, supply chain uh, value act? I think I think we are not the, the pioneer in it because um, in, in other on other national levels, uh, for example, in France, uh, the law of vigilance um, in, in Great Britain, uh, there is a slavery act. In, in the Netherlands, there was a discussion on, on child labor issues. So we, we just um, followed it. And um, as the Germans sometimes are, uh, we try to, uh, to grasp everything and put it, uh, put it into one uh, legal uh, action. So uh, we are not the front runner, we, we, but the front runner, of course, we, we created a blueprint now for the European Union discussions. And I understand that the human rights protection effectively is uh, is behind, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So the UN discussion level um, then materialized uh, on on the national uh, discussion in Germany, and the human rights issue is is the major uh, impact of that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. And now is the practical part. Susanna. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so let's make it tangible mm -hmm. for all of us. Uh, 
I think uh, after everything that we've heard here, the big question for all ours is uh, what's the impact on the business? Uh, I think I have somewhere slides, <laughs> but I don't need them. So I definitely won't click. So <laughs> don't worry about the slides. Uh, uh, I think uh, two points are very important. Uh, it's all about transparency. It's all about data. Uh, and we need to have data available across the company, across the business, uh, uh, in all our operations, what we are doing. So, and the second thing, it's not about CSR anymore. Yeah, I know, I don't think. <laughs> uh, it's not about CSR. It's not about the corporate social responsibility anymore. It's about sustainability and it's about the whole business, as I said, and the operations. Uh, and despite the EU directive, as Eva already said, uh, it's not only because, uh, for example, our company, Vodafone Group, is uh, part of ESG ratings, of uh, independent ratings, uh, and it's all about data, which are somewhere publicly accessible. It's not about data we were asked to give, so they have to be somewhere to find. Uh, uh, this is the one part, but despite this, it's also important for companies who are small and medium sized, because as Eva said, all these companies are part of a big supply chain and they need to stay competitive. They need to uh, meet some requirements of the big companies uh, uh, they supply for. Uh, because as you said, the same for Vodafone, we have some targets, we have some goals, for example, for the carbon neutrality. And there is also the scope three, which is the supply chain. And we have to know the data. We have to know what we have to calculate in the supply chain, in the, in the scope three. We have to know what we have to offset at the end, etc. So that's the important thing. And as I said, it's not only CSR. Uh, there are companies who already are doing the non-financial reporting. Uh, but if you aren't, uh, uh, if you aren't um, listed, so it's up to you what you are reporting. So you really can only report about your philanthropy, about your nice activities, let's say. Uh, but it's not a matter. You really have to uh, report the data from your operations. There are companies uh, which have some advantage, which has some advantage. For example, like us, uh, because as Eva uh, already uh, said, thank you very much for that, uh, for that nice words. Uh, uh, we are lucky, actually. We, uh, or me as a head of sustainability, I'm in a lucky position because we already have some history. We have the data, and we uh, are used to uh, um, uh, do non-financial reports. We have a strategy. We have yearly-based targets, uh, which we evaluate every year. And which is important, we have, of course, many uh, codes of conduct for whole our supply chain. It's ethical purchasing. It's environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera. And what helps us, and this is maybe a small advice for all who wants to start, uh, we uh, are really certificated for ISO environmental management, energy management, and also for the social responsibility, which is Kaspar Schloss Projekos. And it's not an only an audit or internal audit, it's really uh, to be seen positively because it's a check for us if our processes, if our approach is uh, just defined in the right way, and if we can see some potentials how to improve us. Uh, so that's the way how we see it. And we are very lucky in being part of a global Vodafone group uh, who is rated, who is part of the ESG ratings. So internally, we have to let, deliver all the data already. Uh, so what to do if you do not uh, if you don't be in that situation, you have to start somewhere. And what I suggest, and this is actually what we also are doing in the whole process. So even though we aren't at the beginning, we are somewhere in the middle, but we are at the end. Uh, even as we have to improve, we have to add more data, etc. So it's important, or I suggest, uh, from the practical point of view, just to check the main criteria of, of ESG, uh, what's there, and then check your business. Uh, talk with your departments, what they are doing, what's their impact, what do, what do they need? And the second thing, uh, you can evaluate what's relevant for your business. And then the second step is, and it's an example of Vodafone, then check uh, where, uh, uh, where the matches are. So when you look at this uh, picture, uh, these are the most uh, relevant uh, ESG topics for Vodafone. And for example, you don't see their water consumption. Uh, 
at the global level, we report also about the water consumption. But when we check our Czech sustainable uh, business reporting, you don't find the numbers there because it's so the relevance is so small for us. So you will find mostly data about energy, about emissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this is, I think, the first practical step that you just find the matches, and then the second step is you look uh, for the data you already have. So it's not that you are at a zero point, that there are no data in your company. That's not right, because you definitely have some, uh, according to the Czech law, some data about your employees, the number of employees. You have the data about your remuneration, or you have the data about your waste, because you are obliged to report on a yearly basis, etc. So there already are data you have. There already are processes where you have some systems and metrics. So. Don't be scared that you have just nothing. There are things. And what's really worth is to have an internal stakeholder dialogue. Uh, it's called materiality assessment. Uh, 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 but it means that you just talk to your people. And as I said, what they are doing, what they think is relevant for the society, what's relevant for the business, where are the matches, and if they have the data. And you will realize or the people will realize that they are already doing much of that, of that scope, and that they already have some data. And then it's of course the question in the future, if the metrics, how the data are calculated are right or not, because there are, as we have heard, many metrics, many different metrics, but it's the step somewhere in the future. I think then, it, because the important thing is that they, you have some basic data. Yeah, and that's it, I would say. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Zuzana, for a very practical guide. Uh, indeed, a uh, complex issue, uh, complex three pillars, uh, uh, which uh, indeed companies like you and uh, uh, ING uh, have benefited from a long time of transformation. Uh, so we, we have uh, many years behind uh, where we could report uh, and, and uh, learn uh, how to effectively set up the processes and to be transparent. Um, what would you say in terms of your supply chain? How transparent is that for you right now? Uh, shall I be honest or, <laughs> or shall I speak in terms of PR? <laughs> uh, we have some transparency, of course, because we have these uh, ethical codexes, all suppliers have to sign that. And what we have uh, implemented one and a half year ago, we implemented uh, some mandatory uh, criteria on sustainability into tenders. Uh, so we have some data. But as I said, when you ask me, for example, about the carbon neutrality task of Vodafone, there is, of course, the scope three. And to be to speak absolutely honestly, maybe Victoria, who is our specialist for the environment and for the energy consumption, she will maybe uh, add something. But me personally, I am happy that our target uh, for the scope three is 2040. Mm -hmm. uh, because to be absolutely honest, we don't know how to how exactly how we will achieve it because, as you said, and as we all know, there are many companies in our supply chain. They do not have the data. They have never calculated their emissions. Uh, they didn't. They have never done this materials assessment, and maybe they don't want to do it because they don't need it. So it's a big question for us how to proceed in the future and. Uh, what we are doing now, we started with a, a exact agenda for the scope one and two, where our target is uh, 2030. Uh, so to be there clear, and it comes up with that actually, because there are many connections and follow-ups uh, how we will come to the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. It, it is a really recognized at EU level that SMEs and mid-caps indeed is a category which is not fully and well served uh, in this area. First, in terms of uh, raising the awareness and also in terms of uh, resources they have available, financial and people resources to really get uh, into detail of the topic. So uh, that's why uh, the, the banks have decided to create the, uh, the questionnaire, that, that's one thing. And if you uh, go into an initiative change for the better, you will find that there is an effort to create ESG Academy where more than 22 uh, companies have participated to effectively give out all the know-how they have from all the three parts, E, S, G, and effectively a, a, a very uh, short uh, and efficient course uh, of uh, awareness raising and connecting with the right experts who can uh, take also small and middle enterprises in a simplified way 
uh, through ESG and help you here with in the value chain. Because indeed, for SMEs and mid caps and supply chains, it's about the help of the big uh, big companies uh, to the smaller ones. Uh, and I think I would conclude, yeah, Frank. Yeah, I, I just want to to raise one additional. Uh, focus on it. Um, as uh, Susanna, I liked it very much when, when you came up with, uh, with a, a clear um, structure of implementation. Um, I think, uh, by the way, I, I did uh, the Vodafone sustainability report in 2006 for Germany. Uh, I, I was <laughs> as a young, <laughs> young guy. Uh, so um, I think, uh, I think you, you mentioned um, that you have already data or companies have already data in, in, their, in their hand, but to make data to information, you need to contextualize it. So uh, you need you need an, a certain understanding how you can use this data, and uh, this is a is a logical step uh, which which companies, um, if I have to do, and uh, awareness raising is one very crucial part. Uh, but also, and that's my point, um, companies should start now to to manage sustainability and to implement it into their into their daily activities and measure it. So controlling management system is something which, uh, which companies should right from the very beginning consider in order not to, to start always um, from, from the beginning to connect, uh, collect data for CSRD, to collect data for, for banks, for the taxonomy, uh, to collect data for, then for the supply chain law. So not always to start from the, from, from the beginning, just start to develop structure and management system. This is, is an advice um, which I think is very crucial as well. Thanks a lot, Frank. And I leave the floor to you uh, and to your questions uh, to the audience. Please uh, feel free to ask anything you need to know. Good. So I think it, it looks like a very clear topic. <laughs> uh, maybe if I can add something, uh, as uh, our friend Nathan Nicholas said, there needs to be a structure. You need to develop the uh, sustainability management. And it's handy, it goes hand in hand with the data, with the KPIs. You definitely have to start uh, some projects which is related to your business, to your core business, and you always have to set up the KPIs uh, so that you start to measure it uh, at the early beginning. And uh, maybe one uh, uh, personal experience uh, of mine, when I started in my previous job uh, to set up the sustainable strategy and to do the assessments, et cetera, uh, the first reaction of all the people uh, invited to these discussions was, wow, it's horrible. We do not have just anything. What's it? I do understand any word you are talking about. Uh, and then we talked and talked and they just sat at the table and then it was, oh, that's it? We are doing it. That's mm -hmm. great. But I didn't know it's sustainability, actually. And the biggest and the, the main energy I invested, and I'm still investing, to be honest, uh, is to explain to people that sustainability is nothing which is somewhere on top or, uh, or nearby the business strategy. It has to be included. It has to be one strategy. And this is, I think, the biggest goal at the beginning you have to do. Exactly. And in the Academy of Sciences, uh, there are many researches why uh, sustainability sometimes fails uh, in big companies or in small companies. And one of the reasons was uh, mentioned that it fails in the companies where sustainability is on the side. Let's do something uh, sustainable as, uh, uh, on the side, but not integrated into our daily life and daily operations. And, and precisely, it needs to be integrated within the company values. Yes, Fran? Yeah, while well, well, the audience keeps silent, uh, so we have to entertain them. <laughs> yeah, but um, a, another another topic which was raised uh, at the beginning of this workshop today, um, digitalization. I think um, we, we should also think and consider uh, when, when companies uh, uh, want to to um, uh, want to follow certain activities, um, they have to digitalize uh, their processes or at least uh, the data should be somehow structured in a digital system, for example, uh, on, the, on the cloud computing or whatever um, technology is, has been or will be used. So I think uh, this is a crucial thing in order to, to understand uh, where the data came from and how to structure it. 
but digitalization um, should not prevent the, the thinking about the, the impacts of the data. So um, once you, you uh, have it easy to, to press a button and, uh, and fill out a certain questionnaire of a bank or, or even um, some, some other equivalents or whatever your customer asks you, uh, it's then easy. And it's a, it's an, it's a trap, so to say, not to, to follow um, the, the, real, the real impacts behind it, behind the data. So you should have always uh, in mind that uh, digitalization is a tool it helps uh, for for efficient uh, information sharing but also uh, you have to connect it to the management system that's another another topic which i want to raise mm -hmm. absolutely uh, thanks a lot and probably the, the last point uh, that we would want to raise and uh, that in common for all of us is technology and uh, uh, i see that uh, both of you work uh, in technology heavy uh, industries uh, where you are trying to trying to develop smart technologies which help you either engage others in sustainability internally, externally, or effectively increase your impact, right? Uh, Susanna, what, what would you say to this? Uh, I'm just thinking about what you said now that uh, we are trying with our technology, with our solutions to uh, uh, increase the sustainable impact of others. Uh, I would say maybe, a little bit differently, we are trying to help uh, our customers or just the people around us uh, to uh, yeah, to be more sustainable. As, uh, it's actually the same. I wanted to say that we try to help them to uh, decrease their impact on the environment uh, because technology and the impact on the environment, it goes hand in hand. And what we are uh, actually uh, doing in our business, in our operations, it's the same what we are offering to the customers, actually, and uh, it's smart buildings, smart cities, etc. So it's all about energy, uh, energy consumption, water consumption, etc. Uh, sustainable agriculture, and so on. Uh, so uh, these all are things where the technology really can help. But as Frank said, uh, and I wanted to mention it uh, too, actually, uh, it's not only the technology. You always have to look uh, uh, on the at the society what the society needs, what are the biggest topics and threats uh, 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 as uh, the climate change and the urbanizations, et cetera, et cetera, the migration. Uh, and then you have to look at your operations and then where you can match and where you, where you really can create so-called shared value. And then you can look at it if you have technology in your operation, which can help. Mm -hmm. So I see it as the same, the, the, the human, uh, element is the most important. Mm -hmm. Frank, what would you say to this? Yeah, I just want to, I want to, to underline that what uh, Susanna said. So society should be very much considered in, in all, um, uh, all technological uh, applicances, uh, definitely. And, and um, it has hand in hand to go hand in hand. It's a social technology, uh, Social technological system that that uh, sustainability transformation. Um, I, I just want to raise one additional point. Um, the, the the highest impact of uh, sustainability lies in in value chains. So uh, our concentration of of the discussion is uh, mostly on on certain branches, on certain uh, certain technological uh, approaches. But um, we should also consider, and if you if you come to climate uh, climate issues, for example, CO, the highest CO two emission is connected with supply chains. That means uh, not and, and with products in supply chains, of course. Um, that uh, that means that we should have uh, really an, uh, an, an starting a discussion on sustainability innovation. Uh, even even uh, to to produce a service product system, uh, which is more. Uh, more sustainable than that what we have at the moment. So we, we are in a kind of network of uh, technology and social structure. And uh, we should, if we, if we want to come up with, uh, with practical and, and clear solutions to sustainability, we have to uh, consider both together, as Susanna said. I really like this idea. And do you believe, uh, Frank, that uh, your campus can help? 
<laughs> what a question, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 we, of course, we, we cannot uh, provide all solutions for everything. So, uh, of course, we, we, uh, we have uh, the, the possibilities to, uh, to start thinking, to discuss, uh, and uh, to supply with a certain technological solution proposals. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. That, that's very helpful. And uh, probably uh, the, the last question in terms of uh, transformation and behavioral, uh, behavioral change. Uh, we see that uh, in order to uh, effectively implement sustainability within the, the organizations, uh, it requires uh, transformation of thinking, transformation of uh, planning, uh, decision making, and also people's uh, behavior. Uh, is, is that something you would agree with, uh, Frank, uh, Zuzana? And is this something uh, which is happening at sufficient speed, do you think? I don't know, Susanna, would you like to start or should I? Uh, <laughs> I can. Uh, uh, I very often call it not sustainability management, but change management because it's or a culture, culture change because it's a really change of the culture. It's a change of thinking within the companies that they really start to think completely differently about their operations. Uh, they have to stop thinking about, okay, I earn money, I have some profit, what I can do, what could I do nice or good for the society? It's a completely wrong and old fashioned thinking. So we have to think, okay, these are my operations, this is my business, my impact is here at the beginning in the resources, my impact is here in the within the processes, and my impact is here within uh, at the end, uh, within my products and services I am selling. Uh, and where I can behave myself more responsible, more sustainable, where, I, where is my biggest impact, where I can change something uh, for a, Better future is a horrible word, I know, uh, uh, but but that's it. And this is the change in the thinking, actually, that you have to think: uh, how do you generate your profit? Not I am generating the profit and then I'm doing something that nice, something nice. This is the change, and I think these are the companies who already started this process. It's it's uh, uh, proceeding and is succeeding, but I don't think that we are sufficient enough in the general, uh, how to say it, in the general uh, setting up of the society, mm -hmm. still not. Yeah, definitely our speed is too slow, definitely. Uh, but uh, transformation is a very tricky and difficult thing. Um, I make it make an example. So uh, I have a son. Yeah, My son is at school and uh, I tell him, uh, son, please uh, speed up with your learnings and uh, try to uh, try to be a good, uh, a good student, so to say, and um, do more for, for homework. You can consider or you, you can imagine that my son maybe is not very happy about my, my uh, uh, intention and, um, and even now I have uh, either to push him yeah, or uh, to every day tell him do, do, do and, and nudge him somehow a, a bit. So the same holds true with uh, societal changes. Um, so we, we have, uh, we have a, a different, different um, actors in, in the society which uh, follow certain ideas and, and maybe incentive systems. And uh, to, to make uh, a societal change possible, that, uh, that is a very, very difficult thing. And uh, we have to, uh, to, to think about how we can do that. And there are some models which saying, okay, we have to create kind of movements or groups which, which uh, start them to, to, um, to describe the change and, and be active. And then it will, it will go into the, into the society and, and uh, will be adapted there. We have another another point which we face now with the U Ukraine war. Uh, we have uh, changes in the landscape. So uh, dramatically changes. Um, it's, it's with the COVID, COVID pandemic, with Ukraine war, and uh, even with uh, with the the issues of uh, um, reduction of of uh, materials flows and so on and so forth. So we will be forced from external. So the the uh, the extra um, restrictions will will um, will bring us to a certain um, answer to that to that issue. So I think. Uh, we have at, at the moment, we, we have enough pressure to change uh, and even towards uh, sustainability. 
Uh, and I hope that this movement will, will now start from, from now on to be a bit more faster than, than before. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Frank. And I, I would uh, really agree with, uh, with, with what you said. So let's wrap it up. Uh, for, for us, the main message is that ESG train is running at a big speed. Who is not in? Let's see what happens. So it, it's time to start. Let's develop structure. Let's develop innovation. And let's uh, really uh, take our best chances as a society. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you very much, Eva, Susanna, and Sam. Hi to uh, Nuremberg. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, that you have joined us for those great words. If you're interested to get in contact with one of them, just drop us a line. And now, before we switch over to the next panel on everything what you want to know about energy, but uh, didn't have the chance to ask in the last one or two months, your chance is yours with Igor Mara from ING. From Bosch, Victor Tinserova from Vodafone, and Peter uh, Zayarosh from Bose. But in the meantime, now really the president of the Czech Chamber of Commerce, a short video with Milan Schlachta on uh, sustainability. At Bosch, uh, we consider sustainability as part of our social responsibility. In 2020, we became the world's uh, first CO2 neutral industrial company. Now we focus on reducing emissions across the value chain. Here we want to achieve a reduction of another 15% by uh, 2030. To do this, uh, we need the right calculation of the carbon uh, footprint of our products and solutions. And that is our topic uh, for today's workshop. Hi, Martina, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, everybody once again, uh, good morning and a very warm welcome. I think that the uh, energy crisis in general and the spiking energy prices is a definitely filling up the, the uh, news around the globe lately. And um, I think it's of no wonder that definitely topics such as energy efficiency, energy transition, uh, utilization of the energy come to a radar and attention of a many. And uh, I'm very happy to have the ability today to, to be part of this work group and to share the views on the energy transition and energy prices and energy efficiency the colleagues of mine who I think are truly a leaders and uh, front runners when it comes to these topics. Uh, but maybe before we do actually jump into these topics, I think it would be very useful for us to maybe set up a situation a bit when it comes to energy prices themselves. Can we please turn the presentation? <clears throat> Um, we've all heard about the energy prices going up. We all can imagine what the impact might be on us as individuals, on the companies, on the economies. What I would like to focus today a bit on is uh, probably two things. First one is let's focus on the energy prices themselves. Let's see where they were in the past, where are they today, and maybe even let's have a look at where they might be in the future. That is the topic number one. The topic number two would be the utility companies. Because utility companies are definitely the ones who are one of the most impacted by the spiking energy prices. Now, let's have a look. This chart, what you can see, is a two-year history of the energy prices. It's in euros per megawatt. The upper chart tells you about the gas prices. The lower chart tells you about the electricity price. And there's a couple of key takeaways. First of all, if you look prior to October of 21, you will see that we have experienced a long-term period of a very low and very stable energy price. And if we were to even extend it before, because this is just a two years, past two years, if we were to extend it beyond in the past, you would learn that this level of around, when you are talking about the gas of around 15 to 25 euros per megawatt, 
and in electricity anywhere between 40 to 60. We've had for many, many, many years. Right? Now, second key takeaway is that ever since of October 21, what happened is the energy prices went up for various reasons. And they went up extremely. But what is even probably a bigger problem, it's not just the energy prices level themselves, it is the volatility. Because you can see that easily we have gone from anywhere over 50 euro per megawatt to 100 and back to 60, and again, then, then up to 200 and again back to 67. And this is causing the huge problems to, to companies, to people, to the economy as such. Probably the last key takeaway is that if you look at both of them, they look very similar. And I think that, again, it comes as no surprise because gas is one of the main things when it comes to the generation of electricity. Now, let's try to have a look at where the energy prices might be in the future, right? And again, uh, I don't have a crystal ball because I think that uh, today, if you really want to uh, predict the energy prices, you need to have a crystal ball. We don't, but I think there's one thing we can use for us to at least see where the markets expect the energy prices to be. And this is the energy futures. What this chart tells you is that if you were to enter a commodity exchange and you would like to buy, this is, this is the gas future. And if you were to buy this gas for, let's say, uh, uh, for the deliveries in end of this year, in the coming years, this is the price you need to bet. So currently, the price of a gas is around 85 euros per megawatt hour. Now, if you look at the chart, you would learn that for the next full year, you still need to pay the same. Only afterwards, it starts to decline little by little. By end of 26 or early 27, the price is still 30 euros per megawatt still much higher than it used to be in the previous two, five, ten years. So I think we need to prepare ourselves for a period of a very elevated energy prices. And elevated, I mean, probably multiples of what we are, uh, used to be paying. This is not transitory, definitely not. This is more of a midterm, uh, not long-term effect. And I think that anybody who really wants to tackle this, who really wants to manage the cost on the energy side, Energy efficiency is definitely going to be playing a vital role. Now, topic number two I'd like to uh, uh, show you today is the utility companies, right? Utility companies are definitely ones uh, who are most impacted by these energy prices. Nevertheless, at the same time, if they run properly, they can also generate a very, very nice process. Uh, utility company, I think the perfect example of utility company is simply a company which is producing electricity and afterwards selling the electricity. Now, without, without going into really details of how the exchanges work, uh, in general, most of these utility companies, if they buy coal, gas, CO2 allowances, or they sell the electricity they produce, they go to the uh, commodity exchange, they find the counterparty there, and they sell it. Let's imagine a contract by which a uh, utility company wants to sell electricity in December. So they will produce in December, they will distribute it in a, uh, uh, they will deliver it in December, they will sell it in December, and the counterparty will pay the money in December tomorrow. But they will enter into contract today, and they will fix the price as of today. For the company to be able to do it, they need to deposit so-called initial margin with the commodity exchange. This is kind of a down payment. You can imagine it's a down payment or a deposit. This is offset again, the actual payment in December. And then in between, because you fix price today, but in between today and the delivery, the price actually will go up the fixed price or below the fixed price. And this means that either you as a company need to deliver the difference to the counterparty or on the contrary, the counterparty gives you the difference money. Again, before October 21, these companies, if they were to enter into let's say 100 million euro uh, contract, this liquidity, uh, requirement amounted anywhere between three, four, up to 10 percent. Now, for them just to enter into contract, they need to deposit 30, 40 million euros with the high volatility. Easily can happen that with a 100 million contract, they need to deposit 80, 150, even 200 million euros. This is completely unheard of. They haven't produced the electricity, they haven't delivered the electricity, they haven't collected the money, but yet they need to deliver much more. 
The right upper corner is a very simple depiction of how it used to be, the cost associated with the trading on the exchange, and the right side is how it is currently now. Of course, this is creating a huge cost on the side of these companies because for them to be able to deposit money, they need the, the credit lines with the banks, which cost them the money. So they are getting in a bit of a vicious circle. Now, I think that when it comes to energy crisis, there's a couple of uh, uh, key questions we need to ask ourselves. Is it really a commodity crisis? One can say, look, so far, oil is flowing, gas is flowing. So no, it's not a commodity crisis. Of course, there is a huge uncertainty in the future for how long it will flow. Nobody knows. But for many of the companies, this is rather a liquidity crisis. Definitely for the utility companies, this is a huge liquidity crisis. Now, another question is, whom to blame? Is it a green deal? Is it a fossil fuel? Definitely not a green deal. Uh, fossil fuel, that would be a very simple and a plain, and I think even a mean uh, explanation of us. I think that uh, above all, this is really a crisis for energy security. Because in the past, we're used to be building our energy security around three main base modes, uh, coal, nuclear, and the gas. We've decided to phase out coal, some of the country decided to phase out nuclear. Now we are facing the lack of a gas. And the question is, what will it replace? That is something that uh, probably not many, or nobody knows, right? So if I were to sum it up, I think this energy crisis in general will need to lead to a rebalancing priorities because so far we've put the sustainability above the affordability above the, the security and we'll need to simply level these three because otherwise it will not work right and uh as i said we don't have a crystal ball i, I don't know what will happen whether the gas will be flowing whether the nuclear will be switched on again or not but the definitely i think that the energy efficiency and uh, energy solutions are one of the main enablers for us to sustain our production, our economy, our comfort, and our way of living. <clears throat> Pavel, probably I would uh, hand over now to you to uh, talk about uh, a bit about the energy efficiency. Thank you. You can share the presentation, please. So before we start, good morning also from my side. I am coming from the Bosch Thermal Technology and we represent the segment of heating and cooling, of course. This segment is, of course, at the moment very affected, not only by the prices of the energy, but also general situation and by the future heating technologies and so on. And uh, maybe we can start, I will share with you some basic information regarding uh, general approach of Bosch Thermal Technology and also I will share some information regarding possible solutions but to be honest any solution is without uh, some challenges of course so Bosch thermal technology i would say stands on three pillars you can find there on the slide ecological economical and social ecological is of course connected with the climate goals in 2050 you would like to reduce uh, not consumption but emissions by 95 percent a general goal you should achieve Cost economical aspect where it must be somehow affordable and the social, uh, you know, social is very similar to economical, but we have to we have a very diverse society, I would say, different people with different also business sectors, and we have to do it in all sectors. It must be available for complete society, otherwise, at the end, we will fail in my opinion. In the say in the middle of the triangle, you can see how to regarding implementation, and we can see that especially resources, capital, and also in source are very limited. So it can be the issue how to implement it and when, of course. We will be more, let's say, specific which technologies can enable somehow movement further and can contribute to the better, let's say, environment. On the left side, you can see still old technologies, I would say, or still one mainly, but proved to be less. For example, classic combustion, of course, there is well known, not everybody, but a certain, and right over the certain percent of people are, for example, heating with, uh, with gas and so on. It's, as I said, easy, proof, still pretty cheap, but on the other side, CO2 footprint is pretty big. So 
to be honest, this is not our 2020 solution or I think. Solid fuel combustion, uh, this we are speaking not anymore about coal, of course, we are speaking about wood or pellets boilers. Uh, it's a renewable energy, renewable source, but on the other side, you can imagine if everybody will burn wood or pellets or anything else, it can destroy complete Europe because there will be no more food, uh, wood, sorry. District heating, uh, it's usually in block of flats. There is one disadvantage, of course, uh, that you have the connection or you don't have the connection, so you cannot choose whether any is refused or not. But definitely the CO2 print depends on the heat source. Of course, with gas, it's higher, much more higher. With uh, HP, it's much more better. But advantage, of course, of this district heating is that you have one source somewhere and you can, of course, uh, somehow check it, steer it, control it, and it is under the control. Not like that everybody has own, you know, boiler and so on, much more easy. So it's also possible direct electric. Uh, I like this solution because from my point of view, it's the easiest way to be on it, but only in the case if you have really low consumption. So if you have passive house or you don't need a lot of energy for your factory or something like this, it's a really easy solution because how to protect maybe for the future of the energy prices, the easiest way would be not to somehow, you can of course estimate what will be the prices, but of course the best is not to need the energy. It would be the best and you are protected then. Direct electric, uh, nice solution, but very expensive and uh, not so efficient, I would say. So which technologies enables, let's say, green future, I would call it. I wouldn't just mention something like better future or not. I would say different future maybe or something different is coming and we are speaking about H2 combustion. We have already from if I'm right from 2017 we have already boilers uh, operating with H2 100%. Even now today we are able all our boilers uh, let's say to use with also hydrogen and to burn the hydrogen because at the moment uh, all our boilers can be blended by 20%, so it means 80% of gas and 20% of hydrogen. Heat pumps, to be honest, you cannot believe what, what's happened this year, because four months ago, you couldn't imagine something like this, but today, the demand for heat pump sector is, I would say, 10 times higher. And at least in our case, regarding real sales, for example, we are plus almost 300% or something like this. So. But on the other side, it's at the moment pretty emotional, let's say, solution because not every for everybody is, of course, heat pumps good solution. We will speak about the next slide about it. And the combination, of course, of hybrid combustion and heat pump means that heat pump has the best efficiency, to be honest, still, for example, minus seven degree. It's the best solution, but from minus seven degree, it's better to use, for example, hydrogen or another source or these peaks, I would say. It's not standard thing, minus 15, it's, it's not standard. But as I said, there are also challenges on the way. On the left side, you can see heat pumps. Everybody knows heat pump, who doesn't have heat pump, would like to have it today in these days. Everybody thinking about this. But of course, not easy to do it in block of flats, of, of course, uh, because you need outdoor unit and indoor unit. So if you have family house, if you have new build house, it is easy. You can somehow calculate this and you can have a project for that and it's easy. But uh, air to water is the, let's say, the most famous one. It's from 95%. It is now, let's say, sales in the field. It means it takes energy from air and place it to the water, to the radiators. And uh, efficiency there is good, but for the efficiency, you need to somehow prove that your system is prepared. Because at the moment can happen that you have all solid fuel boilers, you will replace it by an HP. But to be honest, uh, it's not, it is possible somehow, but efficiency is there, let's say not zero, but less than 100% because for building efficiency for heat pumps, you need higher surface or bigger surface of the 
the biggest, the best is of course other for eating or, or big radiators because you need to supply the systems by let's say 40% maximum 50 is also okay, but higher temperature is lower uh, efficiency is there. And some other circumstances, because at the beginning, we have to always think about the technology costs and it's for everybody and also operation costs, because some solutions like HP, you need higher really technology costs, but during the years, you will save the money because you spend less money for, uh, for investment, not for investment, but for energy. But for example, for with hydrogen, it is pretty cheap. It will be as cheap as, for example, Plus 15 percent, we estimate like a gas boiler, but uh, then you have higher operational cost. So also topic you have to somehow balance it, and uh, we still think Bosch that we don't have um, only one solution is possible. It could be somehow multi technology multi technology solution should be there, and should be somehow solved or managed without, I would say, emotion, but really agreed with the designers and with other people because it's pretty complicated, I would say. Not easy that you will say it, that you will just buy heat pump and you will save all money. Just only maybe, because this was all, just maybe only two examples that also in uh, commercial segment, there are some possible Say preparation or some possible solution. You can see this is from last year. This is made in Germany, in zero, and you can use, of course, natural gas, but also 100% of hydrogen because we're not ready. And uh, another project is coming from Switzerland, the steam boiler. And not only H2 is, let's say, solution. You can see that you can use this available. Some of the uh, deal with the with these prices of energy, natural gas, light oil, and also we have such a big boiler as uh, possible electricity. So, so at the end, as a summary, I'm more, to be honest, technical oriented. I'm more coming from after sales in the past, and I would say there must be always logic, not only solution is one is there, and the best solution, in my opinion, is to spend less energy as it is possible. Then you can almost use, let's say, any energy and save money. And that's all from my side. Thank you. No, thank you, Pablo, very much. Uh, very, very interesting. And uh, frankly speaking, I think I'll be having a lot of questions, but let's probably keep them afterwards. What I like about the presentation is that. Uh, my experience, whenever we are discussing the energy efficiency, people tend to focus on the electricity and you've covered the heat as well, because I understand that in the heat, there's a vast, vast consumption of total energy. Uh, now, probably let's move a bit from the energy efficiency more to the how to implement it uh, and how to, how to uh, uh, save as much energy as possible. Um, but I do understand that uh, you have a very, very challenging plan. I understand that all of your operations in your uh, company should be carbon neutral by 2025. Which is when we talk about scope one and scope two. That is something I'd be very keen to understand on how you would like to do it. Let's wait for the presentation. I will tell you more about it. Thank you. I understand that because I see it so well. So when we talk about Rosen Czech Republic, um, we are an almost 3,000 e-commerce company with um, approximately two and a half thousand people working in the production facilities in Ostrava and also in Russia. So um, as I said, we focus today on the scope one and the scope two um, because uh, the scope three itself is a part of our global strategy uh, in the complete supply chain. Um, in the scope one and uh, scope two, we talk about 10% of the CO2 emissions, which is already a number. Um, and uh, in those 10%, uh, we talk about only 3% electricity, 17% natural gas. Um, of course, um, we were thinking about uh, when we started also two years ago to discuss about sustainability and CO2 neutrality. It was really a virtual topic for us. And we, um, with Peter Schmid, my colleague, who is here also with us today, 
started to look also on the market who is the right partner to help us with that because we are not we are not specialists. So um, together we developed a strategy which will go now in June in front of our board, um, and we are quite confident that we will be able in 2025 in the scope one and scope two to be neutral. Um, we also see difference uh, in the customer behavior because uh, our main customers are BMW, Daimler, and Volvo. Um, every, every one of them has a different time scope when they ask the suppliers to be steward neutral. Nevertheless, we have signed a new platform with BMW, which uh, starts uh, serial production in 2025, so the goal is clear, and this, this platform must be steward neutral. Um, so that's why we look for a strategy which is applicable. Um, and uh, when we looked also on other customers, we see that there is quite a lot of restrictions. Nevertheless, times are changing. Um, Volvo has announced this week that they reopened the nuclear energy as a green energy because they see the, the, the issues on the market in Europe and at the suppliers. And I think they, they, they also have their own challenges to achieve a CO2 neutral. So if we, if we talk about the strategy itself, so um, I hope you all see it. I hope everybody can see it. So um, we, we start in 2022, which is, uh, so we see starting from today's point of view, um, there are two, two scopes. So the first one is that uh, we have certain operational and urgent measures. So we talk about um, savings in the production of, uh, of compressed air, water, light, um, changing old uh, lighting for LED lighting. So these are actions which, which can be done uh, almost immediately. Um, and uh, also we created together the roadmap. So we have really um, uh, quite a detailed plan how to achieve it. And I think this chart, which is visible here, this is showing the development of the, of the emission allowance in the last years. Uh, and that's basically also how do we forecast that the green energy might, might rise. Because to, to be CO2 neutral, and now let's talk about this 83%, it's not only to buy green energy, that would be equal. No? So our purchasing to buy green energy and it's done for me as a plan manager. Um, nevertheless, uh, seeing the development of the prices, that's not the way how we want to do it. So if you look, uh, um, starting from 2023 to 2025, there are two blocks. So the first one is a fiscal strategy um, or a so-called today uh, power purchase agreement. Um, the fiscal strategy um, is really about how to get um, green energy for a reasonable price. Um, so that's on one side, I would say, one of our now scopes where we started to work on, to find a partner who is investing. You sign a contract with the, with the partner for 15, 20 years and you basically have a fixed price. Of course, you need to find the right partner because our consumption of electricity is 30,000 mega, megawatt per the year. And just to imagine if we would build our own photovoltaic plant, we would need a one-time invest of 32 million euros, which is in these, this point of time, no go, I would say. So fiscal strategy, so it means, yes, you buy green energy, you find a ways how to buy it sustainable uh, and also economical. The second is the restrictive investment strategy. So it means that uh, you work on your efficient improvement, efficiency improvements, um, changing the technologies, um, working, for example, on the gas replacement, because gas is these days much, much more difficult to replace than the, than the dirty uh, electricity. Um, and there we talk about uh, changing uh, from, uh, from uh, gas to biomass, um, which we know today that biomass could cover 50% of our gas consumptions. Nevertheless, from technological reasons, it's not 100% solutions. So this is a restrictive investment uh, strategy. Also, we found solutions on the market that you find a partner who is investing in you, is guaranteeing, is guaranteeing certain saving, and in the first years you combine with your partner, you share the saving, and after certain point of time when the investment is amortized, you get your own savings. And then in the, from 2025, it's uh, about technological strategy. Hydrogen might be one of the solutions how to generate our own electricity or energies. So that's the way how we want to go. Um, I would say it's 
quite realistic. Uh, so there are different ways uh, I could talk hours about it now. So I think we are quite back, my colleague, with all the information, but that's the way how we want to go. And uh, that's why from the scope one and scope two, 2025, it's going to be realistic. If we look on the, on the um, uh, energy mix, now, so you can see that we are today 2022. So um, uh, the gray one is really our 100% of uh, emissions. Um, we see that we already start this year with some restrictive scenario, um, some savings in our uh, consumption and also some small technological changes. Then we see 2023, the mix is starting to change. So uh, still a certain portion of, uh, of CO2 emissions, but the restrictive scenario is increasing and we still, we still target in 2023 to go for nuclear energy. 2024, again, um, a, mix, uh, a mix change. So you can see we start with the power purchase agreement, still having a big portion of the nuclear energy and having, uh, again, an increased portion of the restrictive investment and having the last portion of the CO2 emissions. And still, we, we still here in this upper part in both years still might talk about certain offsets because mainly because of the gas. So from technological point of view, that's, that, that might be still um, two, three, four years technological solution. So still some offsets, but in 2025, you see a mix of restrictive scenario. You see a mix of uh, PPA and still might be nuclear and some offsets. So that's the way how we want to go. Thank you, Peter. Very interesting. I have to say that uh, I'm keeping the fingers crossed because I, especially in this situation, uh, when you want to replace the energy sources, it's not just a question of a price, it's definitely a question of the source because uh, what's happening on the energy markets uh, is very, very hard for you to replace the source any renewables or any other CO2 low uh, solution. I think um, we all should take it as an opportunity. Uh, like you said at the beginning, we can we can complain, we can blame everybody else, but it will come. Customers are asking, but they talk about 25, but already in January 23, they want to see the strategy. And they want to see evidence that you can make it. So if you don't start the search, you can say it's too expensive, it's complicated, but that's not the way. No, exactly. I fully agree. I don't think this is the time for us to sit and wait. This is definitely more of a being uh, uh, very active trying to look for the solutions because nobody else will do it for us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we've said the best for the last. <laughs> we've already heard about the Vodafone and the uh, overall ESG strategy. Um, and I have to say, I pretty much like uh, your company in terms of what it's doing because you've got the uh, ecological sims. I, I understand that you have this switch to green by which you try to educate your customers on how to be more sustainable. Um, and I also do understand that you're very uh, uh, much focusing on decreasing the energy consumptions in your buildings. And this is something that probably I'd like to learn a bit more about. Please. So, uh, I first have to say that I am amazed the fact that Job Rosa has done in a very few last years because our path has started even before the year 2011, since when we are purchasing uh, the renewable energy. So, our approach is a little different, and what I want to share with you might uh, be from a little bit different angle because. The way we do the business is not the way you do the business because you are not a telecommunication operator. Most of you are manufacturers, but there are a lot of examples I believe that uh, can be taken. And as well as we started quite ahead, brought us to totally different situation. When the energy crisis started, we were fully uh, green. And when everyone started to speaking about ESG, we were kind of like, okay, the biggest part is done. We, we're already okay on the path towards net zero but on the way, still not there. And uh, we are not that ambitious uh, on uh, the 2025, but uh, you probably already heard from us in the past year about our main pillars uh, that uh, we are focusing uh, not only about caring about our planet, but as well about the society we are and uh, in a digital way, but as well in an inclusive way. And that's the pillar of the ESG that Susanna has spoken prior. 
for our zero uh, emission or zero waste uh, approach, where we are bringing more of uh, circle economy, which I believe we will hear later in the, in the last part. Uh, for us, when we have a look on the core of our business, it was always the energy. So that's why, uh, despite it's not our core of, uh, business uh, in the way that we are not a utility provider, energy is uh, for us one of the most important movements within the path to sustainability. And uh, that makes that we are powering our network fully on the renewable energy. And as, I, as you will see later, being uh, fully green still not mean that, uh, that the path is over. The energy crisis and the war in Ukraine, the crisis of energy have brought little more of uh, focus of, on what we already knew before that we will need to, to move. So, highlighting a few of our green choices, and as I said, you will hear later, uh, I guess, about the circular approach. Uh, we built our plan uh, that every uh, water phone operation in Europe has to be 100% renewable by 2021. For us, easy because we have been 10 years before. Um, fully worldwide in 2025. Obviously, we are focusing on, on the topics of recycling uh, and uh, e-waste management. But in 2030 is our, uh, is our deadline for scope one and scope two and zero emissions, where the 2040 is the one that is uh, doing much more issues because it's the scope three. And there's where we have a lot of questions. How are we going to approach? Because it's not only our business, it's the business of everyone mm -hmm. within, uh, within the sector we are. Um, so on our path to 2030, uh, it's the net zero that we are often speaking about. How we are approaching is bringing in a lot of uh, different aspects. And our customers would be probably the first who we thought about uh, that uh, we do not want to do something that the customers are not requiring because we, are, we know that customers in Czech Republic are not yet requiring uh, uh, the net zero approach. So we wanted to bring them on the same level. We, we decided to communicate actively topics that uh, might be uh, not uh, uh, maybe that commonly known, but helping as well to raise the, the knowledge of our customers. So as you said, uh, we introduced uh, smaller SIM holders, uh, uh, recycled material for, for the SIM. We are trying to educate the customers about what telephone to buy, because the telephone, it's about the energy that was used to produce it, the energy to charge it, the energy to, to recycle it, and that's the operating activity. Uh, we are talking publicly about using renewable energy, showing to the customers, discussing even in social media where it is quite challenging, and uh, uh, we provided in the last year several activities to bring them into the recycling uh, fund and to help them uh, to bring more of their e-waste from homes uh, to, uh, to our retails where we can start the recycling process. Uh, for the customers, uh, we communicated publicly, as I said, on a definitely a massive amount of, uh, of uh, media. Uh, we have uh, not only our website, social networks, we've got the newsletters, we have got uh, the, the leaflets at the retail stores, and uh, recently as well, uh, our Instagram account. So uh, there are a lot of op opportunities, how to communicate, why we are doing and what we are doing, and trying to bring them in. Uh, employees uh, are the ambassadors, so they need to be the same way aware. For us, uh, one of the biggest successes of last year was that we offered uh, to our employees uh, to be on the same ship as we are. So not only Vodafone purchasing green energy only, but all our employees had the same opportunity to uh, buy green energy for their homes. Uh, we negotiated uh, a very interesting offer for them which in the end, which we did not predict uh, once negotiating that, helped them to cover very or recover very well from the energy crisis that hit the uh, Czech Republic in autumn 2021. So uh, what started as something uh, that we believed in ended in a very success story from employee care point of view. <laughs> and 
and uh, we are as well um, not only training uh, the employees but giving them opportunity uh, for sharing their ideas which is the lunch pet activity where the uh, Vodafone employees can share their uh, ecological approach and this year it is a lot about technology for the planet so we are uh, looking forward to uh, more and more uh, uh, digital approach uh, ideas directly coming from our employees. As I said, obviously training, obviously sharing a lot of information in a very different uh, ways. When it comes with uh, the society, we are not afraid to speak <laughs> and we are trying to, to, to make everyone understand that our uh, strategy to approach to sustainability uh, can be adopted by any company, small or big. So you can see here many conferences we have attended uh, and uh, supporting from the students in the Czech envy thesis uh, up to the throughout Czech Republic uh, study about uh, how homeworking and COVID uh, years uh, uh, impacted the emissions because, uh, and that's very interesting study showing that we can save a lot of energy when, the, when the, uh, uh, our employees are not in the office. But on the other hand, and especially in Czech and in Germany, the consumption of, or the, the emissions uh, from the consumption of heating and electricity is much higher. So we have got much in common in Czech and uh, Germany on the way how to help the households on their path uh, towards uh, net zero emissions. For the uh, digitalization, uh, outside of you probably know, we are introducing the 5G and doing a lot of digitalization uh, uh, activities, especially supporting the small and medium business where we see that uh, they are struggling with expertise because you as a big companies have got uh, your teams within and your experts. But for the small companies, this is very crucial to give them a hand. And I'm really happy that uh, there are a lot of activities in the Czech Republic that are helping them. And IoT would be the topic, uh, what was already Susanna mentioned, where we are uh, directly trying to reduce the emissions uh, within the Czech Republic at our customer side. So we are providing them with our technologies that are being used by us, which is, for example, the smart building, which I did not incorporate too much into the presentation, but I'm happy to answer later. Uh, how to save uh, uh, the emissions on uh, the office buildings, which is our expertise, but in our customer case, it's often as well in the production buildings. Uh, we are now focusing on other segments as well, for example, agriculture, which we find very interesting segment for the IoT use uh, because of the huge impact on the emissions of the energy use, of the water use, and relevantly because we are talking about Fertilizers use that means a massive amount of energy that stands behind. And uh, when I would just show you how we are with the data and what we moved, uh, we still need not only to purchase the green energy or the renewable energy, we need to decrease the amount of energy we need for the service we are providing. So here you can see our energy is rising. But as well, we have got a massive increase of data consumption uh, uh, that uh, is being uh, seen in the Czech Republic. This is data only for Czech Republic. Which means if we have a slight increase in energy consumption by the massive increase of data, when we turn that around, it shows how the effectiveness of uh, the, the uh, network is really getting better, which means that this is the thing that any company wants to do, because this not only means less emissions, but it also means definitely more interesting economic approach, because more effective you are in the production, uh, more easy it is to uh, persuade your colleagues to go on the path towards sustainability. And uh, this uh, slide would show you about our uh, emissions, where we are towards the path to net zero. But on the same way, we are trying to measure how many uh, emissions or how many tons of uh, recalculated CO2 emissions we can help our customers via the IoT technologies. And this is getting really interesting in the past four years, where more and more customers are using our technologies uh, in their daily business 
helping avoiding their direct scope one and scope two emissions. And that would be it. And I hope that we still have time for questions. Thank you, Victoria. Very nice. Um, we have a. In the interest of the time, let's open up the floor for a, for a question. Should there be any, please? Yes, And better, my apologies. Before we answer, I think we need to repeat it for you at least to hear. So there were two questions. First one is relating to the car fleet. So what are the measures you're going to take there? And the second one is on the offsetting. Whether again you will be using offsetting for your CO two neutrality. So to the question number one, um, the clean mobility is for us scope three, because we as Prozer have the strategy to lease cars. We don't buy cars into our own invest. So it means that we need to bring that requirements to, to our leasing companies on one side. Mm -hmm. And the other side, um, the clean mobility itself, if we look into the CO2 emissions is the lowest part. Um, and if we talk about the basically cost to get the benefit is the really on the last place. So if we talk really in, in, the, in the high priorities, for us is the electricity, is the is the gas, are the actions in our own production and the key mobility is, is, is the last. So we we'll answer it scope free on one side and on the other side, it will come later on after we have solved our electricity and gas. <coughs> and uh, for the for the second uh, for the second question, um, I have no answers in this point of time. Uh, because we, if we talk about offset, um, we still we still think that the, the ratio of the offset offsets will will decrease. So we have a say quite a realistic projection. Um, nevertheless, uh, if we talk about our partners who are dealing with the power purchase agreements, um, think that this will be this will be the, the smaller part. But we still need to look on the even on the group level how we will approach the offsets generally for the for the production plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if I could give of some example on our car fleet uh, approach, because we own the car, so it's for us scope one, scope two. Uh, we are decreasing the car fleet by seven to ten percent every year. Uh, by using a very uh, smart management approach in sharing the cars. Uh, it's a person-free uh, way. So you do not need a person who would be handing over the car. I think in the past we have shown you uh, on, the, uh, on the guided tour in, uh, in our office uh, that uh, you do not need anyone and you can replace the car uh, or return it, take it uh, anytime, 24-7 which is uh, very handful when you want to use less cars for more employees. And we are replacing by plug-in hybrids. So hybrids. plug-in hybrids, yes. So that's, that's the solution we are approaching. But the, the, the reduction is, uh, is the, okay. it's, it's the core. Because we we are charging the whole uh, office building uh, with renewable energy. So any charging done within our building would be renewable. Outside. And outside, uh, the way that we are mainly thinking is charging at homes would be the, the, the challenging one. And that's why uh, we implemented the green energy offer mm -hmm. for any of our employees. OK. Uh, probably, again, in the interest of time, let me wrap it up. First of all, thank you very much for your presentations. Very valuable, lots of very nice information. Uh, the elevated energy prices are here. They will stay here. I don't think that there is much that we can do about it. Of course, we can be smart. We can use energy efficiency to the extent as we can. I think we have learned today many, many nice ideas which we can implement. I think what is most important is that uh, even here in the Czech Republic, we have many of the companies who are front runners. I think this is something that uh, we can be definitely uh, proud of. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much for this great panel. And before moving our last panel, you had heard something about a best practice tool, which is something that is integral to our importance for sustainability approach, something that is definitely to come again in the next half year. So we will keep you posted on where you can get more inspiration on the spot with the companies. So now my pleasure to invite the last panel, the last switch on everything you want to know on circularity, decarbonization, and other related aspects. So also how we can lower this input. So it's my great pleasure to have here this representatives from Circle, from Bosch, uh, from BASF, and from Skoda Auto. And in the meantime, we'll show you again a short video. And so if you ask family companies, are they sustainable? Yes, they are. And since a long time, so I'm happy to show you a video from our member company of the German Chamber of Commerce and Partners for Sustainability in Borders. Borges was founded more than 150 years ago on the idea of recycling textile waste. Our automotive products consist of almost 90% recycled materials and most of them are even renewable. for joining this panel. Thank you very much for actually having us and for having the topic of circular economy. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Sergio Klepek. I'm running the largest recycling platform uh, in Europe, uh, circle.com. We also help actually companies to decarbonize. And today I'm actually moderating this uh, workshop on the topic of circularity, decarbonization and uh, efficiency production. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with so many distinguished guests. Uh, so maybe I will start with the lady. Uh, and uh, so please welcome the Pavlina Babkova uh, from Bosch, actually from the Department of Powertrain Solutions, Cost Engineering and Benchmarking. Warm well, welcome here. Thank you. Also, colleague of, of yours, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Martin. Is Martin. It? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Martin, also warm well, welcome here. Uh, so Bosch is a leader of manufacturing the whole, whole world, I would say. Uh, so I'm very curious about all the things we will discuss. And we will be very tangible today. So please be open uh, with all the good things, also bad things. Um, second, I will actually go to Skoda Auto, uh, to Pavel Kirmela. We actually had a conf call last week, right? So we are quite in touch. I'm very happy. And uh, Pavel actually is running uh, and coordinating the project is cut out towards uh, the CO2 neutrality. So very important, very important quest, I would say, for the whole Czech, Czech Republic, because it's not just Skoda Auto, but it's also so many companies uh, in the supply chain of Skoda Auto. So also warm welcome here, Pavel. Thank you. And the second, uh, last but not least, uh, Boris Gasper, actually uh, managing director of EASF. Uh, well-known uh, German uh, chemistry company, also very important player in the global transition towards the circular economy. So Boris, uh, warm welcome. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Uh, I will have a very quick brief, uh, and then we will just get into a presentation. Um, I'm very happy, actually, that the topic is named circularity, decarbonization, and efficient production because that's exactly what actually the circular economy really is about. It's not a PR topic. It might be like five years ago, but it's really a big, big business topic. And it used to be a topic for sustainable managers in many countries, many companies many years ago, but now it's really in the core of the, of the topics in the boardroom. So for example, I'm very happy that it's put out or have the sustainable board discussing circular economy very often as also many other companies 
also in Bas topical circular economy also in Bosch is, is a very big one. Um, in current discussion about the decarbonization in our global economy, we very often hearing about energy. And we also heard many interesting points in the, in the last panel. And it's absolutely crucial topic. But I would love to give a little, you know, uh, um, uh, a little bit more light on the scene, also the typical circular economy. And a couple of numbers for you. Uh, we globally extract from the planet Earth every year 100 gigatons of materials. One third actually we waste. And in general, actually, materials and handling with materials, so the way we extract them from the planet Earth, the way we handle them in production and post production, is responsible for 50 to 70 percent of the CO2 emissions actually globally we produce. So it's not just about energy to actually decarbonize ourselves, it's also about how we handle materials. And of course, how we handle materials is not just about handling the waste management, uh, which is, is a nice thing to do, I recommend to do so. But actually, it's also about changes in business models. It's about changes in, uh, in eco-design and, and in so many areas, actually. So it's really important to focus on circular economy. And in, with European Commission, we calculated that actually 35% of all the materials in Europe, we can actually, in the raw materials, we can actually avoid when closing the loop in the Europe. And that's a lot, especially when we now discuss the energy and, and material efficiency as a whole Europe. Uh, so very important, very important topic. And the last things I would mention, uh, coming from Paris to, to Munich and to Prague, we need to speed up because we really see a big brand and many companies really securing their green sourcing for the future. And I'm very afraid, especially for example, the mid-market companies here in Central Europe are a little bit you know, behind a bit. Uh, because the green sourcing, there was a beautiful white paper of McKenzie about the green sourcing published uh, uh, six weeks ago. I and mean, then actually, uh, what they analyzed that uh, in 2030, there will be a double of actually need for green sourcing. There will be actually available amount. And I can really confirm the message because in our big largest recycling uh, platform in Europe, 14,000 companies are actually trading their waste and buying uh, green materials. We already actually see a huge shift now. Two years back, it was a lot about persuading, persuading companies to buy some green materials, some, some recycled materials and so on. Now it's actually much tougher to get the materials to the company. So actually the shift is already here. And the white paper was published just before the war actually. And, and now it's, it's really a speed up process here. So material efficiency, um, it's really important, and not just from the CO2 point of view, but also uh, as a strategic uh, a business tool. So by handling material in a good way, you can really do a lot. And I'm really happy we cooperate actually circle with, with uh, two <coughs> these companies a lot, I would say. Uh, so let's now deep dive into it. And uh, maybe let's start with, uh, with the Bosch, uh, a, a big, big manufacturing brand. So, uh, Floor is yours. We are looking forward for, for five to seven minutes of your presentation and then the discussion. Okay, so uh, you're all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very really happy to be here today with you. It's the first time for me to present like this, so uh, I hope that I will manage it. So um, I think that you called us like cost engineering and benchmarking. But actually, we are eco engineers. Have you ever heard about eco engineering? Do you know what eco engineering is doing? No idea? Okay. So, sustainability is frequently defined as a balance of economic, environmental, and social aspects. We at Bosch, we believe that we can combine it. Combining, uh, doing uh, the best for the planet and being profitable can go hand in hand. Welcome at Sustainability Like a Bush. So, uh, quite simple picture, but a lot of message behind it. Our new dimension, Sustainability 2025 target vision, describes six fundamental dimensions of vice. I will start with the first one on the right side energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy. Second one is water scarcity and water quality. The third one is sober economy. Because you know, our life 
is happening inside the, our products lives their own cycle. So everything is somehow working in a cycle. Um, responsibility and human rights for sure, health, safety, and substances of concern. And last but not least, very important for now, climate protection. So um, someone of you explained a bit uh, about, uh, let's say, scope one and two. We have also scope three. This picture is quite difficult. It's tricky to understand, but let's start with it. Let me explain, please, uh, the scope one and two. What does it mean at Bosch? And um, I have to say, and I'm very happy to say, that for scope one and two, we already became CO2 neutral in 2020, so already two years ago. So what next? Um, yeah, we have quite complicated scope three, upstream and downstream, and this topic was touched here also a bit. So our next goal, our next vision is to eliminate, uh, let's say, use of compensation certificate for scope one and two, additional to what we already have achieved. And of course, a bit tackle scope three. Not only a bit, because uh, we cannot, uh, let's say, uh, influence it by ourselves, but uh, for scope three, we need our suppliers, very important. So we would like uh, to tackle a bit this topic uh, through our supplier chain, uh, through our material choices, and uh, through our own design decisions. So eco-design is the right point here. Yes, it's a challenge, but on the other hand, it's a chance to enhance the competitiveness. To be honest, I don't like this. I don't like this slide <laughs> because it's too much information, too much text. But um, as I mentioned, what is a client action theory? Yes, it's true. So we want to reduce these upstream and downstream uh, emissions by 15% in absolute terms by 2030. I will give you a number. This 15% means from today's perspective to cutting our climate impact by 67 million metric tons of CO2. It's a huge number. As such, it became the first automotive supplier in the international science-based target initiative called SBTI. And we became a member of Carbon Disclosure Project called CDP, which we rated as with an A. So what else? Uh, tackling scope three uh, means for us, especially uh, purchase goods and services. We know uh, that we need to work closely with our suppliers. They are very important for us. For that, we identify the largest CO2 emitting supplier groups and started addressing our aim to reduce emissions to them. For logistics, we want to reduce transport, especially air freight, optimize routes and capacity utilization. And very important, not to forget this, is the use phase of our products. Let me give you an example. If we are able to optimize the efficiency factor of our product, the end customers would need to find a way with electricity, gas, and hydrogen to operate. And if our products are being used for many years, this can have a quite high impact. Okay, so let me give you an insight by showing the example of reporting on corporate level. Our way of sustainability has been some 10 years journey. One important step uh, I was mentioning in 2018 when we started CDP, CDP reporting itself. Two years later, we even received an air rating and now we are asking our suppliers who became part of that as well. The majority of the 500 suppliers asked to join CDP, did so. And this year we strive for even more. As you can see, already 2000 suppliers are asked for that. By doing that, we recall the social responsibility of us and our business partners to contribute to climate protection by increasing awareness, transparency, 
and corresponding reduction measures. So uh, what is the final message? As I mentioned, we really believe that we can combine both. We can be profitable and we can do all the best for the planet. Bosch and then the product. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And already congratulations for some very important steps to uh, being made. Uh, I love the, the term invented for life. Uh, and you mentioned also that actually you see a potential that actually bringing a circular economy and a profit in the same time. How about changing the motto for invented for a lifetime in the product, like you know, like a prolong the, you know, the, the usage of the tools I'm buying very frequently from, from you actually. Is there still a business case? Can it be changed in different business models? How do you see this area? Uh, as I mentioned, we are eco-engineers. So let's start with a very important, very, let's say, early phase to design. So I think it's uh, it's the right way and, and it's the only, the, uh, only the right way how to, let's say, optimize all these targets. It's not possible to, uh, let's say, reduce when you do not know your design, the, let's say, carbon footprint uh, on, of your product, because this is exactly what we are doing. We are calculating carbon uh, footprint of our products. So that's the only way. And uh, let's see what the future will bring to us, because I think uh, the philosophy is very good. And let's do more exercise in the practical life and let's bring it. Let's bring it. Absolutely agree. The second topic, you mentioned your supply chain. It's always, and we cooperate very closely for many years with IKEA, for example, all the supply chain of IKEA and Goodyear. And, and it's very hard to change things in one big company. It's even harder to change it in the whole supply chain of the company. What other thing actually works for you when you cooperate with the supply chain of Bosch? I think uh, generally we would need maybe um, totally new purchasing models. And one of the, let's say, future sourcing criteria would be definitely CO2 factor. This mm -hmm. will be definitely a uh, new, uh, let's say, KPA for us. Uh, not only the cost, because we are always talking in some clear, clear language like money, right. like uh, euros, dollars, whatever we want. But on the other hand, uh, we need to consider also this impact. So this can go, like I mentioned, hand in hand in the future, not only for us, but also for our supply. Mm -hmm. To calculate the CO2 of the water management, the energy management, uh, the waste management, yes. and the proper episode. Yes. And it's in the plan for like next you know, couple of years or already, is it happening? It is happening. It's happening, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. It'll be definitely time for questions in the end. Thank you very much. And let's go to a second speaker. Let's go to Skoda Auto, our crown jewel of our industry here in Czech Republic. So, Pavel, we are looking forward. The automotive industry is full of challenges now. Um, yes. And it's, it's really fascinating because you can, can change not just the one company, but all the whole the, Half of the Czech Republic here really uh, changing Skoda Auto. So, very curious about the things you are doing in Skoda Auto. Uh, yes, you are totally right. Nowadays, a lot of challenges. And I will talk also a little bit about that, about our targets. But let me start uh, with the thing we are talking about. There's the sustainability strategy. We also have one. We are now revising the sustainability strategy for 2030. Thank to my colleague, Debor, from the strategy department. Uh, he's the lead of that. And as all of you, we have the three main pillars in our sustainability house, environment, social, and governance. Today, I would like to focus on the environment pillar. Here on the slide, I want to mention that we also created an external sustainability council. That's an external council. That means people not from Škoda that are advising us, what are we doing good, what are we doing bad, and in which direction do we have to go? It's really important to have also the feedback from the external stakeholders because sometimes you are living in the Škoda world and not seeing what's happening outside. Basically, it's sold. When we look on the environmental bill, we are already having since 2020, uh, 2012, sorry, the green future. We built it in a pyramid and we made three main pillars, green product, factory, and retail, because that are our main focuses. If you look on the whole life cycle, 
In the factory, we are doing only 2% of our CO2 emissions. In the product, something about 80, including also the fuel supply. And in green retail or the end of the life, are we making plus suppliers, are we making about 20, 15%, something like that. We also integrated this green future strategy in the group go to zero strategy. That's actually the strategy that till 2050, we want to go to zero impact of our factories. That's a real dream. We know it's not possible, but you have to have a dream to make things happen. Some of our targets, as already was mentioned, they are part of the science-based target initiative. Škoda alone not, but we have a science-based target for the whole power group. We have the 1.5 degree target. This is the most ambitious target that nowadays is among the competitors. I think the other competitors have it also, but no one has one degree or zero degree. We have zero waste. The zero waste from production that is going to landfill. Because we said we want to use our waste from production in a better way, not to put it on a landfill and don't know what happening with that next 40, 100, 200 years, but we want to use it materially or energetically. And now is our task to go from the energetic use of the waste to the material. We are putting it on the higher level. 52.5%, that should be our goal in the energy efficiency and CO2, our impact on the environment. We have five KPIs per car that we are following. That's energy, CO2, waste, water, and VOC, volatile organic compounds. And we want from 2020 to 2025 go on 52%. That's more than a half of all these emissions are going to be avoided. Another really ambitious target is minus 50% CO2 from the fleet. That means from all the cars we are producing and buying to the customers, we have to decrease the consumptions of them or the CO2 that's basically the same. Zero CO2 that's in the production and till 2030, we want to have all the energy used for the production of vehicles and components in Škoda Czech Republic plants to be CO2 neutral. That means the transition from the not good sources of energy to the good and great ones. We are not taking in consideration the nuclear power plant because the nuclear power plant is CO2 neutral, but not actually the green one. And then the CO2 neutrality. That's our target for our plants in 2050. We are talking about CO2 net zero because we, we are not able to produce without CO2. That's actually not possible. If someone says yes, no. And we achieved already in 2020, the first plant in Berklavi to be CO2 neutral. Yes, we compensated something about two and a half thousand tons in 2020. And in 2021, it was only 210 tons that had to be compensated through offsets. It was a little bit about target that we have. Yeah, really ambitious, some of them, a lot of work. And now let's go to the particular project that we are making. Because I know it was about circular economy, is all. Uh, I wanted to introduce how we approach the circular economy process at Škoda. Uh, I think still knows it very good because it was also at the beginning when we started to talk about circular economy. It was at Škoda and we asked what is the circular economy about and we were discussing. We had to create an X-functional team because, cross -functional, because it's, it's not possible to do it only from one department. Because if you want to make something circular, that's from design, production, uh, customers, uh, then recycling, end of life, and it is good. To has, it has to go back to the suppliers, and we have to take it. So we have to quality communications. Not easy. A lot of involved people. Nowadays, we collected more than fifty measures that are only the first ideas. To, uh, from twenty eighteen, we implemented more than ten measures already. We didn't know that there are circular economy projects. Make it because it made sense. That's something like oil recycling. It's circle, but we didn't know it before we call it circle. Yeah. And our targets for the next years is to have concrete number of projects because there is nowadays no other measurability that is easy to follow. There are some kind of, uh, kinds of LCAs and so on, but that's really not easy because to create an LCA takes a lot of time, a lot of money, 
and sometimes it doesn't make sense because also the quality of the data you have is not nowadays on the level. And it's also the thing we want to uh, increase the data quality that we are receiving also from our suppliers. That, that's not some animals database that we are taking data from, but that we we'll get from our suppliers, the real data. Another project that you can see and you will see in the future in our cars, we are using recycled and natural materials as a filling of some of our parts. That's every time a long, long process from the development through quality, through implementation in the, in the car project. But uh, I think some of them you can already see, like uh, this is from, uh, from pet bottles and so on. You have to follow the, the LinkedIn from Mr. Schnake, our board member for purchasing. He is promoting a lot, and he's also the part of the <laughs> data IHK, which is the Czech industry uh, So we will see much more because they are also making a sustainable innovations project and presenting a lot of these product related achievements. Another project uh, already running green steel. Uh, the steel is basically easy to recycle. And if you use green energy for the producing, you can also decrease the CO2 footprint of the battery or the battery housing. And one idea we have, and we are hard working on it, is from old to new bumper. That means we are taking old bumpers, recycling them, and then using the material again in our bumpers. Sometimes there are problems with quality, but we have to <laughs> tackle it. What's at the end? It's really important. That's also biodiversity. That's a topic that's uh, quite clear for everyone for us that you want to have nature and everything. But uh, in the plants, not all the time is going everything in this direction. Because if you want to bee house or some some trees and so on, may, sometimes make it problems because you have no place. Uh, there are people allergic on on bee, bee sting and so on. But we are trying the best we can also to make biodiversity come true at Škoda. And we also have a plan uh, through our external affairs, also not only in the plant of Škoda, but also outside the plant. And to improve the environment also for the workers when they are out of the plant at home, so they can enjoy the green in their vicinity. Uh, another project that I had, uh, I already presented it here, uh, in the framework of the best practices tour. And that's uh, our a new paint shop at Škoda. We are using, uh, in a simple way, the limestone that is used for uh, the catch of the oversprays when the cars are painted. And then we are uh, putting it in our Škod Energo uh, power plant as a filter for uh, when, when, burning, when burning the coal. And Last but not least, very important is the communication and involvement of our employees. Uh, last year, we had a really successful Green Week when in one week we presented all the topics that are green at Škoda. It was more than 40 speakers, more than 20 hours of live stream, and we could reach all of our employees. Thank you to Gabriela Ticha, who organized it. She is in the call. Thank you very much. This year, how we're going to have Green Week 2022. And then also on the group level, there's an activity that's involving all the people from the group. And I really think all, not only in Czech Republic, Europe, but also in Brazil, in China, in India. This is one hour dedicated to discussions about, about environment. And you discuss and you tell what are you doing personally for the environment and what can you do. It's not only what are you doing, but also you get inspirations from the others. Here I'm on the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Once more, thank you for inviting us and looking forward for questions. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you very much. Right, you do many things as good out. Uh, as good out. How do you decide what is the most important to do you know, here and you know, how to put it in the timeline, actually? Yeah, actually, the political timeline. Uh, First thing are costs. So we want to decrease the, take the low hanging fruits uh, in comparison to energy. And if you can spare energy, you are sparing energy. The second one are the CO2 targets that are now actual. But when we tackle all the CO2, what comes next? Then you will get the VOC. Biodiversity is really important because 
now we know that we don't need only to decrease the CO2, but also to make something from nature to regenerate. Right. So it is, it, is, it is a stream. And now with the Ukraine and Russia conflict, we are also thinking about uh, autarky, to be an autark, um, yeah, to, to have our, how is in English, autark, so such independent, yeah? Yep, so such to have everything in place and not to be, you know, to have the dependence on, on, on yeah. some, some other sources of energy and of everything we need. Because you can see it nowadays that it's not only in the car industry, it's also in machinery, in also in the building sector, everywhere. We do not have anything we can buy for less money and right now. Mm. Very interesting what you just mentioned. The, the material self-sufficiency is really important for all the industry in Europe. Is there any something is something you would actually be able to share already how to do it? Some of the companies do the refurbishment of the, for example, you know, all all you know, car parts and, and you're having a refurbishment area, for example, Renault, uh, I met them in Paris last week. Uh, they really try to put back uh, some of the parts, label them actually, check the, the quality and if it's okay quality, put it put it back. Is it the way you, you're thinking to go in Skoda Auto or? Yeah, I think we want to go in the way that uh, first, we need to know what materials do we have right. and we do not use it in the proper or in the best efficient way. Right. That's also we are making with you a circular scan. Yeah. The close the loop in both sides of the plant. Know, all the streams. We know we have ways, but we maybe do not have the right context. Right. Then the second really important way is to go on actions like this one and discuss with others and mm. share the idea. Mm. Because I think in an environment, uh, there is no uh, competition actually between us. It yeah. has to be clever cooperation, not competition. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you very much. Thank you. The collaboration is really one of the key principles of circular economy because the industrial symbiosis uh, it's really it's really very powerful. So thank you very much, Pavel. And we will continue with the questions after the very last speaker we have today, uh, Boris Gasper, managing director of uh, BSSF, the, the big chemistry company. And today we will talk a lot about the camera cycling. But I also will be very curious, what are your general plans here in the Republic? But also because you previously work as a general strategic uh, in the bus and global. Also, like how do you see bus actually moving uh, in the direction of sustainability in the future? So Boris, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril. And um, I'll stay sitting to keep the, the, the workshop uh, <laughs> flair so the colleagues can also sit down. Uh, if you don't mind. So today I would like to address a topic that is emotional to some of us, and that's plastic and, and plastic waste, and uh, go very specific of, uh, into one of BSF's uh, projects, which is basically uh, the chemical recycling of plastic waste. We call this a uh, recycling project. And let me start with uh, a rough overview of plastic waste in Europe. We have 2018 produced uh, around 30 million tons of plastic waste. Now, the good news is we are able to recover a big portion of this plastic waste, uh, but only a small portion is actually recycled. Uh, I think only around 31% of this waste is recycled, uh, almost exclusively mechanically recycled. The, the rest is then split to landfill, 25% uh, roughly, and uh, an incineration to produce some energy. So uh, we think and we believe that there is still room uh, for improvement to go away from this linear uh, economy to the more, more recycling one. Um, in Europe, fortunately, we have a, only a very, very small portion of, of uh, leakage uh, or leaks of, of waste, which is unfortunately on a global scale, a, a different topic. Uh, but let's move now maybe on to a bit uh, a busier slide, but I would like to ask you to focus just on the on the below part. And for those who are not aware, I would like to give you a small excursion in, in how plastic is actually being produced. So we start uh, today, uh, we have uh, NAFTA coming out of the uh, refineries uh, from crude oil. NAFTA is being fed to a steam cracker. The steam cracker then produces the basic chemicals such as propylene and ethylene. These are then converted into, into polymers and then by adding different additives or, or other monomers, we actually create plastics who then are 
transform into the finished goods as we know today. Um, and these finished goods, all of us consumers, we use them for a certain time, and then we, they basically become waste. Now, and as we already discussed, the, the linearity of this plastic waste uh, is based on either this plastic waste is being incinerated or goes to the landfill, and the small portion is being recycled um, mechanically today. And we think that uh, chemical recycling is actually a, a very good complementary method to the mechanical recycling. Uh, complementary because for mechanical recycling, uh, the, the waste actually has to meet certain criteria, uh, certain uh, uh, purity and, and um, grades uh, of the polymers. And the rest is, is rather difficult. And here where chemical recycling can come into play. Um, and actually the uh, chemical recycling would then feed back the material and close the loop uh, back to the steam cracker and, be, and uh, be available again for reuse uh, all the way to the, to the that we have. And this is where BASF's project ChemCycling is, uh, is, is focusing at. Uh, let's start with a dark blue uh, part in, in, in the cycle to lead you through the ChemCycling project. And uh, I very much like the, the collaboration that was mentioned here also by, by the colleague from, from Skoda because this is really what, what, uh, what it comes down to when we talk about this complex project. And indeed, BASF is, is uh, having multiple collaborations also in, in this project. So let's start with, uh, with the, con the, the, the <coughs> finished good becoming a, a waste. Um, consumers use and dispose the waste. Now then, waste companies come into play. They collect the waste and, and sort it. And uh, our partners in this project, then they take the waste and they uh, convert it uh, in a thermochemical process called pyrolysis into pyrolysis oil. This is then being purified and uh, we, we take it up as a feedstock and feed it back again in the beginning of our production process in our production network. And then these materials are allocated to the individual uh, products that we then again sell to our customers who produce the finished goods. And this way we are able to close the loop also for <coughs> plastic materials. Um, and yeah, uh, keyword collaboration. Um, I would like to mention here a, a few of our partners who are uh, very key in, in making this project work. Uh, just a few of them, Quanta Fuel, for example, is a specialist to, uh, in the technology of, um, of mixed plastic waste pyrolysis. We also invested into this company and are working together. Uh, to, to, to produce, uh, and actually there are already uh, pilot uh, amounts of products being generated here. Byron is another company from Germany. Uh, they actually uh, focus their efforts into the priorities of, of uh, end of life tires. Um, and last but not least, new energy, uh, again, priorities of end of life, end of life uh, tires. Uh, who we collaborate with, and um, that's basically how we um, tackle this problem of, of uh, having the plastic waste kept in the loop uh, as long as possible. So I hope I was able to give you at least a little flair, a feel of, of uh, how we uh, deal with plastic waste in this one project. Yes, of course, as many colleagues here, we have our corporate targets and uh, and also many other activities, but I thought for the sake of this workshop, I just really focus on, on this one project and I'm really uh, open for any questions or have a good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Boris. Mentioned many times the dirty work of plastics, uh, but actually uh, it's how do, how do you work actually with the, with the public awareness that actually plastic might be quite good, actually. If you run rural LCA, plastic very often is much better than some, you know, than some kind of like a paper-based or, or different material or PLA plastic. And it's quite complicated to, to, to communicate this topic nowadays, isn't it? It is indeed. Uh, and I fully agree with you. Plastic in many, many cases actually is the, the material of choice, also in terms of, of sustainability. If you think about, I don't know, just uh, just uh, mobility, 
with plastic, you can reduce the weight of the vehicles, thereby you actually contribute to lowering the, the CO2 emissions. If you think about plastics in the food grade, you can uh, have barely any, any other materials that would actually replace them, medical devices. So there are many, many applications where plastics are actually the, the key material to go to. So uh, from our perspective, plastics uh, are a very good material to use also for the future where we do have to get better and, and work for the future is keeping the material in the loop uh, and get away from this linear economy and thereby also avoid, uh, avoid you know, the, the incineration and, and the landfills to avoid getting the plastic into the environment. And here, of course, us as the chemical industry, we, there is a bigger role we, we have to play, but also each and every one of us as consumers, we can also contribute, you know, just how we behave, how we dispose the plastic, how we separate, basically uh, support the entire process. Mm. Thank you very much for this. To maybe put it in context, a couple of interesting numbers. We just recently ran a big uh, recycle with analysis for one retail. And we, for the 2,500 products, we analyzed what actually the happened really with the product. And funny thing is actually the 78% of all the plastic products will actually go through the sorting uh, under the yellow bins and everything we know, but in the end, only 28% actually of all the products they put in the market, they actually are recycled. So we are now hitting a bit like the glass glass uh, roof. And I think the camera cycling, the product is also a very important part of the solution. I fully agree. And part of the, the challenge today is that why this, this rate is, is where it is, is because most of the plastic waste today is recycled mechanically and it right. has its limits simply yeah. uh, and that's why alternative and, and you know alternative methods like chemical recycling can really contribute also to reduce this uh, or increase the rate of recycling even higher fantastic Boris, thank you very much so we have three amazing speakers now is the time for all the questions we we have so you first thank you i have a question to bring some more but a very good result so how did you achieve it? <laughs> <laughs> I will just maybe say once again so people can, can hear it. Uh, so the question was actually quite curious question. How did you achieve actually being neutral by 2020 yes. to, the, to the Bosch? Yeah, actually, I expected this question. <laughs> I can give you the recept, I would say, and then you, you can cook your own. <laughs> So uh, it's quite simple, I would say. Um, it was so uh, many times mentioned beautific. It's, it's about, let's say, energy efficiency. You can imagine whatever you want in the, in the manufacturing process, in the single, let's say, uh, manufacturing process when you are producing a specific part, you can save the money, you are better energy efficiency. That's, for, that's one of the examples. Uh, then uh, alternatives uh, like, let's say, more uh, clean energy, more green energy. Not only we are not, I would say, we are not the one company uh, which is uh, doing these things in a simple way. I mean, uh, just buy the carbon offsets and make everything green. This is not our way. So we are trying to combine all alternatives whenever and um, whenever it's possible and whenever we can. And the next recept is, uh, I would say, um, where we cannot uh, combine, when we cannot, let's say, replace, then we have to go to carbon offsets. But this, we would like to minimize as much as possible. And this is our main target also for the future. And uh, of course, this, uh, a big uh, topic is green electricity. So there are uh, several locations within the Bosch Big Group which are uh, completely uh, green from a uh, green electricity point of view. There is nothing more than green electricity. So I would say it's quite simple, but of course, a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of different mindset. So for example, we as Bosch, we are trying also to sensibilize our, let's say, uh, employees. So we have a special uh, stations where we can show directly to our employees, okay, if you are, uh, let's say, set off this machine, then you can save this amount of money. 
So it's, it's very useful because when we are talking like this, when we are showing presentation, it's only a theory, but you need more practice. You need to get the feeling for what is sustainability, what is CO2 emissions reduction. And I think this is also a way how we can do it. So if I can, one of the best practices or examples which we are doing is, so uh, for example, we are using the special equipment to check in the production, some air leakage or something. So colleagues are time to time in some specific period of time, they are checking the air leakage in the production. And if they see something or with the equipment, find out some uh, air leakage, they can do some uh, change of the pipes or whatever is necessary. So this is one of the examples. And then the, of course, the photovoltaic systems, which we are also using in our plants. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. Because we are currently in the investigating uh, the offset options. What type of offsetting are you purchasing? So I will just repeat the question what kind of offsetting you are purchasing? The question from Vodafone. I'm not sure if I can, uh, let's say, talk about this information. I think it's more a uh, deep dive, it's more internal information, and I think I cannot give you the right answer. Okay, maybe we can follow up later on uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. really it's about a lot of uh, the symbiosis. Pavel, you had it. Yes, we are using uh, verified emission reductions. Uh, certificates are mainly the gold standard uh, because they had high credibility. And after the visit, we will not make any good motion. <laughs> good approach. Thank you very much. All right, very good question. Do we have some more questions to our speakers? We have, I think, the very last, the very last uh, time for a for a last question. All right. So if there are none, it was a fascinating discussion with you. Um, to sum up, actually, I think there was a lot of uh, discussion about uh, having a right data, gathering some low hanging fruits. Very often, like a, in a, a material. And a close the loop. Also, also a lot about energy, uh, um, and was also a, a lot about the, the cooperation with suppliers, which is very important. And it's still, I would say, ahead of us uh, to, to to tackle this down. But also with collaboration with uh, with other companies. So it's really, I think, it's really fascinating to be having uh, the bus cooperate a lot with other companies, and and it's really, it's really important. So a circular economy can definitely play a big role in the transition for decarbonization. Uh, it's material better usage. And I'm really happy that you actually had a chance to share your stories, inspire each other. And that's exactly what the circular economy is also about. So thank you very much for the speakers and the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you very much to the great panels. We are at the end of this event, but definitely not at the end of what we can still do in sustainability, what we can also try to do to achieve together. And this is what we think. It's great to continue, to continue not only as a working group in the chamber, but also to be very active in the future with other events. So this is why we want to say with uh, Christian Greenfar, thanks to all the partners for sustainability that helped to bring sustainability on the table where it was more about, okay, is this uh, like some kind of PR uh, team? No, it's not, it's hardcore. There is something where you can do something. So thanks very much for all of those who engaged themselves with their knowledge, with their contacts experience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of the team. So, Apart from Kristen and me and Ben Habauer, there are many other people that help to really get uh, the Partners for Sustainability going, bring it up. So we will definitely stay in contact with you. Thank you to all of those. And I can ask one thing. And and thanks, to, thanks to Honza and, uh, and to Jakob Strella and Honda Erga for, uh, for the job that all this is running and working. Thanks to all the partners. Uh, for sustainability, for creating the platform with us, for uh, joining the platform. Thanks to all the guests here, uh, to the speakers, the moderators. Thank you very much to the people out there in the virtual room. Um, and we are very happy uh, that, we have, that we have you here today in person. And let me just announce the next 
big event, uh, which is very, very much into sustainability. It's the German Czech Economic Forum, the 17th of uh, October, and uh, the Partners for Sustainability will have their very important slot there, the working group uh, we are creating now, or we are going over to. And uh, we are uh, hosting, the Chamber will host this uh, event, and we are, we are very proud. Um, we can announce already now uh, that the Vice Chancellor, as Mr. Bauer said, um, and Minister uh, of Federal Minister of uh, Economy will uh, come and have the keynote, uh, Mr. Habeck. And he's very busy right now, not with, uh, um, not with building and rising up uh, um, wind crafts, but uh, with uh, <laughs> some, some organizing energy in Europe. And so this is going to be very interesting for all of us. Um, and the topic is actually efficient and resilient, uh, driving tomorrow's industry. And please join us, uh, put a mark into, into your calendar right now, the 17th of October and stay resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, and on the 17th, we'll be more than happy that you will, that you are online with us, will share this class of mine with us offline and QBEX. We're looking forward to see you there.